you are here, just a few announcements at the beginning of the time of worship. The Greek group is having a get together on May 15th. We have a retirement celebration for Kathy Morris after 32 years of service here at the church on May 21st. Also, the Mother's Day brunch is next Sunday, the 14th. Reservations for that, please get those reservations in. We'd love to have you at both those lunches. We just need to know how to prepare. So if you haven't done that, please turn that in as soon as you can. Uh, please read your bulletin for all the important announcements that are here today. And at this time, I am going to call together for the congregational meeting. This will just take a few minutes. This is to elect new officers to serve in the church for the next year. So I'm calling you to the order and I hope you ask you to pray. Gracious God, as we meet, be with us as we do your work and serve your people. In your name we pray. Amen. I begin by asking our session clerk if we have a quorum, and I see that we do. So I'm going to ask Ted Goff, the chairman of the nominating committee, to come forward and make his report. As Ted comes up, just one change. I need to mention that for the deacon class, one of the has actually been ordained as deacon before. That was, on, that was on my part. So just to make get that right thing to go with Ted and then Ted. Morning. Morning. The nominating committee uh, places before the congregation the following individuals as deacons for the class of 25 and 26. And if you are here, we would appreciate it if you stand. Wendy Banco, Carol Danver, Wanda Marlin, and Linda Watts. Uh, the committee also places into nomination uh, Elizabeth Butana, who will serve one year as the youth deacon, and Kim Brandt, who will fill uh, a one-year unexpired term. Okay, the nominations are before you. Are there any nominations on the floor? Okay, hearing none or seeing none, we will move forward. I need a motion to approve this slate of deacons. So moved. Thank you, Dave, and a second. Approved. Thank you. Over here, thank you very much. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Ted. The nominating committee places before the congregation the following individuals to serve as elders for the class of 25 and 26. Again, if you're here, we'd appreciate it if you'd stand. Nan Bennett, Del McPherson, Michael Thompson, and Eleanor Zediger. Also placed in nomination is Marshall Winkler, who will serve a one-year unexpired term. Again, the nominations are before you. Are there any from the floor? Seeing none, a motion to accept. So moved. Thank you. And after all the hands are up, so I'll take that as a second as well. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. When I took over this position, I thought it would be the easiest one in the church, and it turned out to be a little more difficult than I thought. So I would like to thank all the people that served on the committee that worked very hard to, to uh, come up with the elders and the deacons. So I'd like to thank Dave Scott, John Murian, Fred Sutton, Holly Kohler, and Randy North. Thank you. We need a motion to adjourn. We're going to do this by consensus unless there are objections, which I hear not. We will close and adjourn our meeting. Gracious God, we thank you that we take our work for you seriously, and together we all serve the church as one. In your name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. If you can sit down for us. There you go. Well, so those girls right over there in the nice white robes, those are our confirmates. So what that is, when you become an eighth grader, you come to me. Hi, Lauren, come on up. You get to come to confirmation class with me, and you learn all about what being a Presbyterian is, which I know sounds very exciting. You get to learn about our awesome church, and we go and visit other churches to see how other people worship. But the most exciting part, other than going to Duncan, an awful lot, right girls? Look at their smiles, you can tell. But probably the best part is they become an even more important part of this church family. Just everyone here loves you little ones, they love the big ones, and we include you in every single thing we do. So, can you tell them congratulations? But we want to say a prayer for you, so let's all bow our heads. Gracious God, we thank you for this wonderful Confirmation Sunday. We thank you for these three young ladies who have put in the time and effort into even furthering their faith. Please be with them and guide them on their new path as they begin this next journey. God, we thank you for everything that you have given to us. In your son's name we pray, and all together we say, Amen. Okay, you can go to Sunday school now.
O oh God of wisdom, let these words of scripture teach our hearts, that we may hear your joy and gladness for the sake of Christ. Your wisdom for us. Amen. Our scripture reading is from the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verses 10 through 18. Hear, my child, and accept my word, that the years of your life may be many. I have taught you the way of wisdom. I have led you in the path of uprightness. When you walk, your step will not be hampered, and if you run, you will not stumble. Keep hold of instruction. Do not let go. Guard her, for she is your life. Do not enter the path of the wicked, and do not walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not go on it. Turn away from it and pass on. For they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble. For they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The word of the Lord.
gracious Lord, we thank you for all the gifts that you give to us. That we can show with our talents and our skills that we can celebrate and serve you. May these gifts that we bring forth do that for you and this world. Amen. Thomas said to them, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the 
way. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us look to God in the Gracious God, open our hearts and minds this day as we listen to, receive, and go out from here and act on your word now and always. Amen. There are certain scripture passages that we read and study on special occasions or at specific times of the year. We turn to the birth of Christ on Christmas Eve, Palm Sunday, and crucifixion we do during the Holy Week. The resurrection story on Easter Sunday, the tongues of fire resting on each person's shoulder as we cited at Pentecost. First Corinthians 13, the love chapter is almost always read in a wedding ceremony, and there are several passages that we use again and again at a memorial or a funeral service. These words of scripture provide stability, and it is a relief to hear them at specific times throughout the year. I mean, it would be odd to tie in Pentecost to the Ten Commandments or to tell the Jonah story on Christmas Eve. It is important to read scripture that is on point to the situation at hand. Let me give you an example. When I perform a wedding and I ask the bride and groom to pick a scripture verse, I always insist that they run the Bible passage through me before they list it in their program. When I was in seminary, I was told a story, and I really hope it's true, because it's a wonderful story. I told a story, I was told a story of a couple who picked their wedding passage, and they did not tell the pastor what the passage was. They selected a reading from 1 John chapter 4. An excerpt of that chapter is like this. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love God does not know God, for God is love. Beautiful passage for a wedding. The bride and groom, not being familiar with their Bible, inadvertently picked a reading from the Gospel of John in chapter 4. They forgot the little one in of John. Had they checked with the pastor, they would have read a lovely passage about the love of God. Instead, at the wedding, congregation heard the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery. <laughs> and the bit was, that was read was, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have five husbands, and the one you're with now isn't even your husband. That's uncomfortable, isn't it? <laughs> but I do believe scripture is crucial to our daily living. Now that being said, it's not always as simple as which scripture is germane to our situation because scripture can fit multiple circumstances and life experiences. Today's scripture brings comfort at a funeral, but it is also a great reminder of our faith journey and can be applied to our everyday life. In the book Feasting on the Word, Holly T. Marshall says this, Many rich theological themes surface in this passage including the believer's union with Christ, hope for life after death, Jesus as Savior, and the relationship between Jesus and the Father. It is in these themes that we find the richness of Christ's words and the foundation of our faith. So let's look at it. Verses 1 through 3, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. This is easier said than done, because who among us does not have troubled hearts? There are, here are some things that can trouble our hearts. Countries at war, the threat of terrorism, world hunger and poverty, social issues such as racism, gender identities, and if we stay a little closer to home, we can worry about the rising cost and inflation, the economy, social media, school and other shootings, feeling safe in our own communities. There are also worries and fears that affect us on our personal level, our relationships, our careers, 
can be made the bills, divorce, illness, retirement, tragic circumstances, and on and on it goes. Life can be a series of events that trouble our hearts. The good news is that our loving God knows this. Jesus is very reassuring here. He says, I know what life can do, and don't let it throw you. There is no reason to let this be overwhelming. Your loving Father won't see you wrong. You can trust God to see you through. And as God's Son, you can trust me as well. I will help you stay on the right course. So that life doesn't get to you. Focus on me and you will be fine. But Jesus doesn't end his thought process here. Because he's not just talking about our troubled hearts and the things we deal with now. He is also telling us not to worry about eternal life as well. He mentions that in his Father's house are many rooms, meaning that in heaven there is room for everyone, which can be counter to our lives in which we now live. We spend our lives being turned away, hotel rooms with no vacancy, concerts and sporting events that require a ticket to gain access, Membership places that limit who can belong, people who shun us and keep us out, and lots of times in our lives when we feel alone and isolated. But God is not like that. God's love is always right in front of us. Heaven is not like that. Heaven is as big and as wide as God's heart. And Christ is not like that. Jesus goes in front of us. Jesus blazes a trail that we can follow. Jesus prepares the journey. All we have to do is put our trust into his hands. And so when it's all said and done, it should be quite simple. Do not fear. Trust God. Believe in Christ. And all that we need in life and all that we need in the life to come will be given to us by the God that loves us. In verse 6, we have one of the greatest things that Jesus ever said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. Jesus said, I am the way. And feasting in the Word, God on Senior says this, the notion of the way has deep roots in the biblical saga, including the journey of Israel to the Promised Land. In the Synoptic Gospels, it described the journey of Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem. In Acts, Luke notes that the Christian movement was entitled the way following the way of Jesus and carrying the gospel to the ends of the earth. So if you want to see God, if you want to know what God is about, if you want to know how God feels about us, if you want to know what God is up to, then look no further than the life of Christ. Jesus is the way to God, the way to forgiveness, the way to grace and mercy, the way to eternal life. Professor William Martin puts it this way, Suppose we are in a strange town and we ask someone for directions. Suppose the person asked says, you go down here, you take the first right, and then the second to the left, cross the square, go past the church, take the third on the right, and the road you want is the fourth on the left. We'll get lost before we get to the top. Now suppose the person we ask says, Come on, let me just take you there. Follow me. In that case, that person is the way to us. And we cannot miss where we're going. That is what Jesus does. In Scripture, Jesus doesn't just say he is the way. He doesn't just teach. He doesn't just give advice. He doesn't just tell us about God. He takes us by the hand and leads us. He gives us direction. He walks alongside us. Gives us strength. He doesn't tell us about the way. He is the way. He doesn't tell us about God. He is our God. Through a personal relationship with Him, we will know the way. Jesus says, I am the truth. That is the wonderful thing about our Lord. He not only taught others about God's truth, He lived it. We don't have to be a people of moral character in order to be good at what we do. A person doesn't have to be kind and decent in order to be a good geometry. An individual need not go to church and live by Christian principles in order to be a good carpenter. And anyone with the right drive can be a good salesperson. They don't have to be above reproach to believe in and stand by their products. 
When it comes right down to it, do we care if our doctors are overweight? If our math teachers know how to do the Sudoku? If our barbers are bald? Or are we more interested in the job that they perform? I am more interested in a person's job than in their discrepancies. However, when it comes to moral truth, when it comes to our values and our ethics, then what a person does and who they are is very important to us as a people. We expect our pastors to be pure, our doctors to be healthy, our policemen to obey the law, our firemen not to set fires. And based on that, it is crucial to our faith that Jesus not only speak the truth, but that he live out the truth, be the truth, and embody that truth. In him is the perfect example to follow and the perfect person to lead us. And finally, Jesus said, I am the life. Human beings are constantly searching for their lives to have meaning. I know that there are exceptions, but for the most part, if you were to ask the regular person on the street what they wanted to get out of life, I think very few would say, I want to be the richest or the smartest or the most famous or even the most infamous. I think most of us would say, I want to be fulfilled. I want to make a difference in someone's life. I want to make this world a better place. I want to leave this world in better shape than it was when I entered into it. I want my life and the way I live to have been worth it. All of that is possible when we recognize Christ as the life. When we aspire to live the kind of life that we live, selflessly, <coughs> excuse me, trustingly, obediently, a life that accepted and blessed and gave and served and forgave others. A life that recognized the importance of love. A life that put love first. A life that put love above the rules. A life that loved us first. A life that loves others in a way that celebrates who we are. A life that knows what God is like can lead people into God's presence and remain with them every step of the way. We can live like that when we recognize Jesus as the life. And in fact, we are doing that right now in worship. It is a special day for us here at the church. It is Confirmation Sunday. We've seen this morning in the three young ladies who have spent the last several months studying the scripture, growing in their faith, learning about this church, visiting other places of worship, writing statements of faith, and they have been examined before session of our governing board. All because they have that desire to stand before us and say, I love Christ, I put him first, and I want to serve him in this place. They are making a commitment to serve God with their lives. Just as we did, just as we do every day by the way we honor and serve. We commit to God when we hear and understand what Jesus does for us as the way, the truth, and the life. My Bible commentary sums all this up very nicely. It says, as the way, Jesus is our path to the Father. As the truth, He is the reality of all that God promises. As the life, He joins His divine life to ours, both now and eternal. Wondering aimlessly and kind of trying to figure out 
who he was and where he was going. And then one day, James meets another boy about his age, and they become fast friends, and James figures out kind of quickly that this boy is a bad influence on him. He kind of made him do things that he knew wasn't right. He kind of made him say and believe and live in a way that just didn't feel good. And then one day, he convinced them to sneak out at night, to go downtown and to spray paint, to put spray paint all over one of the buildings downtown. And he was arrested immediately. He was caught. He was taken to holding. He was taken before a judge. And the judge said to him, Young man, I'm going to give you a choice. You can go to a juvenile detention center and serve out your crime. Or you can join a new program set up by the Department of Children and Families where you can bond and get to know with other foster children so that you can all see what it's like, the kind of life that you are living. Well, of course, he took the activity rather than the jail. And so when the time came and he had their activity day, and, and James was with the other kids, he liked them. But he didn't bond with them, he didn't get to know them. Because instead of choosing to do the, the activities with all the other kids that day, he decided to go and take the opportunity to work in a homeless shelter instead. He thought he had it pretty rough and he wanted to see what it was like for the way people that were worse than him were living. So he went to the homeless shelter. And when he got to the homeless shelter to help that day, he met Henry. Henry was a 40-year-old man, a father, a husband, a Christian. He decided he wanted to do more, so he came to the shelter that day to help out his church. And Henry and James were instantly connected. Henry admired James's spirit. And James finally found an adult who treated him as an equal and not as that kid in the foster system. And so they volunteered to work several days at the shelter together, side by side. They handed out socks and they cleaned up the place and they, they went to food banks and farms and restaurants and got food for the homeless. They, they made hundreds of box lunches and they distributed them all through the homeless community. At one point, one of the homeless people asked James if he would say grace and bless the meal. And this kid who never had a purpose, this kid who didn't know his place in the world, without hesitation or reservation, just bowed his head and said a, uh, said a prayer, a lovely prayer, a prayer that thanked God, a prayer that blessed the people in the homeless shelter, a prayer that thought of other people, a prayer that brought a tear to Henry's eyes when he heard what this boy was doing, what he, how he was capable of actually living. And after their work was done at the homeless shelter, James went back to the foster home, and Henry went back to his church, his work, his family. About six months later, Henry called James and said, I'd like to take you to lunch. They did. They went to lunch, and they talked as friends, and James told them about his hopes and dreams as young people all had. And he felt, for the first time in his life, he had a focus, a connection, a commitment, something where he could take his life just because this man was taking the time to him. Henry had ulterior motives. For the last six months and for the next six months, he would be filling out paperwork and he would be attending classes and learning the system and going through all the red tape so that one day he and his wife could adopt James as their son. And so now the story goes to where it starts. James is in court, wanting to know his fate. He figures he's there because another foster family has yet again thrown him back into the system. And he's meeting the judge to find out where he's going next and to start all over again. You can imagine the surprise when Henry and his family walked in the door with the adoption papers and announced that they wanted him be his son and be part of their family. There wasn't a dry eye in the courtroom, especially from the judge. Because it, apart from that one infraction, that one misstep that brought him in front of that judge, that changed his life, apart from that, every time he went to the foster system, every time he had to go to court, it was the same judge who he went before. And the judge was showing tears of joy because 
that this was a kid who meant well, this was a good kid who finally found the right and finally found someone that would bring him into his family. And if ever there was a time to say, and you live happily ever after, it would be with that story. James is a good kid who was just trying to find his way in life. And Henry was a good man who was living by Christ exactly. Trying to find our way, living as God tells us. Which one do we embrace? All of it? None of it? One or the other? Let me put it another way. When all is said and done and our time is done on this earth, how do we want to be remembered? Is it by our words? Is it by our deeds? Do we want to leave this place better than when we arrived? Do we want to make a difference in someone's life? Only time will tell. But in the interim, it's easy. The formula is right there in the scripture lesson for today. We want to be healthy and safe and people of God. Do not let our hearts be troubled. Trust God. Trust Christ. And know right in front of us we have an example of the way, the truth, and the life. Let us pray. Gracious God, we look at as we move forward today, doing your work and serving your people. We pray everything in your name. Amen. Um, as we move into the time of the Lord's Supper, will you please join me in the great thanksgiving that's printed in your book? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Friends, this is a joyful feast for the people of God who will come from east and west, north and south, and sit at table in the kingdom of God. This is the Lord's day. Our Savior invites all who trust Him to share in His peace. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to them. Their eyes were open and they recognized it. Let us pray. Gracious God, we praise and thank you for the world which we call our hope. You formed us in your image and we rebelled against you. You did not reject us, but you sent your prophets to call us back. And in the fullness of time and out of your tremendous love, you sent your only Son to be one of us, to set us free from sin, and to heal our brokenness. And moreover, to promise us that one day again, in the fullness of time, you will return to your kingdom, to its complete fulfillment. Therefore, we praise you with all the angels of heaven, with the prophets, the apostles, the martyrs, and all the faithful of every time and place. And in thanksgiving and praise, we ask the Lord that this bread and wine might be set apart from all common use to this whole holy and high use, signifying all promise in Christ our Lord. Amen. On that night, he took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance.
Thanksgiving food. Jesus also took the cup and said, This cup represents the new covenant, sealed in my blood. For as often as you eat the bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim my death until I come again.
I would like to introduce you <clears throat> to Samantha Metzinger <laughs> and her parents, Don and Bill, and Isabel Izzy Greco, and her parents, Paul and Jennifer, and then we have Olivia Noble and her parents, Mary Beth and Joshua. They have worked very hard over this past year and they have met all of the requirements of confirmation and they met with session and were approved as members. And so now I am going to ask the four questions of membership. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you trust Him? Do you intend to be His disciple, obey His word, and show His love? Will you be a faithful member of this church, giving of yourself in every way, and will you seek the fellowship of the church wherever you may be? Is that simple? Please stand and affirm the faith of the church. Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered at the Pontius Pilate, was crucified and dead and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Gracious God, we are so grateful for this day, a day of blessing and a day of joy, as these three young ladies have made their commitment to us and to you and to their lives. We ask that you bless them. Continue to be with them, be with them throughout life, and on their journey of faith. In your name we pray. Amen. As soon as the church is over, which is in just a few minutes, we are at our reception in the parlor, which is out of the sanctuary, and just keep going through the open doors, where we will have taken punch and have an opportunity to speak to our confirmants and the families and welcome them to the church.
from the earth the people who are sent. Wherever you go this week, consider that God is sending you there. Wherever you find yourself this week, consider that God is placing you there. That the love of Christ that dwells within you can reach out and touch others through you. Know this, Lord, God's love, God's peace, and God's power. Amen.